But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Now this is the great apostle Paul speaking, writing to the church of Philippi. He's under house arrest at this time, but even though he is under house arrest, he has already accomplished and done some great things for God. He's planted churches, he's raised up leaders, he's made disciples. Uh, not only was he being very effective in his life with Christ, but even before Christ, he was a very successful man. He was a very religious man, had great prestige, respect of many people, and uh, we'll see that a little bit later. But yet, even as a Christian, he was effective in what God had called him to do. But this is what he's saying. Listen very carefully to this man is saying. The things that were gained to me. How many have gained a lot of things since you met Christ? We might have lost some things too, but probably the things that we lost were good. That we lost them. Like I always tell people, people sometimes tell me, you know, I want to give my life to God, but if I give my life to God, God's going to then want to take this from me and take that from me and take this. I say, yeah, but all those things that he wants to take are no good for you anyway. They haven't got you anywhere. They haven't really helped you in life, have they? Amen. Have they really brought you to a place of success and, and fulfillment in life? No. Amen. And so there's some things that, that, that sometimes we, we have to let go. Be willing to let go if you want to advance. If you want to excel. If you want to be elevated. If you want to be successful in life, there are things that we need to gain and there are things that we need to let go. He says, the things that were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of of the knowledge of Christ, just that I might know him. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, this is his desire. This is his passion. It wasn't to have all the material things of life. It wasn't to have all the prestige and respect of the world. It wasn't to have, you know, all, all these things, amen. But what Paul's passion was, was to know God more and the power of his resurrection. And, the, and even the fellowship of his suffering. Do you know that Paul counted it worthy to bear the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ upon him? Look at his, his perspective. Look at his philosophy. In other words, you know, Paul many times for, for preaching the gospel, for doing God's will and serving God's purpose, was opposed, was, was per persecuted, was, was whipped, was scourged, was put in prison. Ch chains were put upon him, amen, for preaching. The, and you know what he, you know what his attitude was? His perspective was, I count it worthy to bear the marks, the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The same way he suffered is, is listen, I count it a privilege to suffer with him. That's pretty heavy. Because today, nobody wants to suffer. Nobody, who wants to suffer? Nobody wants to suffer, Amen. But Paul says, I even would like or desire or have no problem with the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And there are many times that the apostle Paul was so close to death. Many times he was, it was that close. I mean, he, was at, he even said, I am at a point of... I don't think I'm going to make it through this. I'm going to die. But yet somehow, some way, God came and God rescued him. And he wasn't afraid of death because he knew that if he died in Christ, he would live. Look at verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. 
He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you now for the precious anointing ministry of your Holy Spirit to speak to us this word. I pray, God, it will be a blessing, an encouragement, a strength to someone here today that they can close this chapter and enter a new chapter with a greater focus and clarity of goals and visions for their life in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we get ready to step into this new year of 2019, close this chapter and step into a new chapter of 2019 of our journey with God, I would like for you this morning to consider four keys, four keys of taking charge of your destiny. It's important and it's my prayer and desire that, that as we come into a new beginning, a new year, that we would understand the importance of destiny. That we would understand the importance of who you are and why you're here and why God created you and why God put you here on earth. That it's not, you know, for, for anything else but his pleasure, his will. God has a plan and God has a purpose for each and every one of our life. We hear this all the time. And the most important thing and desire should be in every Christian is to know his will. To be able to walk in the perfect will of God. To know that I am doing what God had created me and called me to do. There's no greater joy and fulfillment to know that you are walking in your destiny. There's no greater fulfillment in life. No matter if everything is going good around you or it's not. doesn't matter. As long as you know you're in the perfect will of God and doing what God created you and appointed you to do. Let me tell you something. What's happening around you, it does not matter. Your world can crumble, but there can still be this unspeakable joy that surpasses all understanding. Amen. And this, this, this peace that, that, that you can't even in, in explain or describe because because you know that you're in God's perfect will. And no matter what has happened, that you know that your God is more than able to turn all things together for good because you loved him and you're called according to his purpose. So I pray that we would take charge this year. Take charge of our destiny. Take charge of your future. Take charge of your calling. Find out what it is God wants you to do. Don't waste any more time beating the air, not knowing, well, is this what God wants me to do or is this what God? If God has called you and God has chosen you, though no matter where he places you or where he puts you, the grace of God, the favor of God will be with you. Amen? God's protection, God's provision will be there as long as you are there in the perfect will of God. Amen. And sometimes you might not, it might not look that way. It might not look like everything, all the provision is there. It might not look like all the protection is there. It might look like, man, ever since I made this decision, ever since I, I've been doing what God, I felt God wanted me to do, all hell has broken loose. Well, I got good news for you here today. And listen, it doesn't matter if all hell has come against you. Listen, what do you think that the devil's going to do when you choose to make up your mind to serve God and do God's will for your life? It doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. Sometimes it, you see the favor, the blessing, and sometimes you see the opposition. But don't get confused, my friend. If God has called you, if God has chosen you, if God has appointed you to do this as his will, then so be it. There's somehow, some way, God will turn it all around. God will turn the bad to good, what the enemy meant for evil. He'll turn it around for good. It's time to take charge. I want this church to take charge of our destiny. People do not dictate what our destiny is. The world doesn't dictate what our destiny is. People can say what they want. The world can say what they want all about you. Amen. But let me tell you something. They can't take charge or influence your destiny. How many are ready to take charge? 
Four keys to taking charge of your destiny. First of all, number one, are you ready? The first key is to evaluate. As we close this year and we step into a new year, this is a good time to start to evaluate your journey, your walk with God. Where are you with God? Where are you in your call, in your ministry? According to the gifting that God gave you as a person, are you using that gifting for his glory and for his pleasure? Where are you with God? Where are you in the call of God? You know, everything that he's given to you to edify the church, to edify the kingdom, be a part of expanding the kingdom around the world. Are we where we should be? I've always said this, you heard me many times, we're, we're, thank God we're not where we used to be. We might not be where we want to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. But you must never settle or be satisfied with where you are. That's a danger. That's a danger because these people that settle don't realize it is just as much of a danger of where you are than where you've been. There's only one place I know where to go, and that's forward. That's into tomorrow. Because God holds my tomorrow. See, if I stay where I am, then I'm taking charge of where I am. And I'm going to pay the price for it. But if I'm willing to let go of certain things and take hold of the prize that is set before me and run this race with patience, with endurance, then I know that one day I shall receive the crown of glory. Oh, somebody got to shout for that. Amen. See, Paul here was evaluating. As we read the scriptures, it was a point in his life. He's already planted churches. I mean, he came out of a, of a respectful life. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was respected, a very religious man, had very, uh, a great position in the world, whatever. But then he had a head-on collision with Jesus. Jesus came and interrupted his miserable life. And then he, 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 he surrendered to Christ and said, Lord, whatever, what is it you want me to do? The Lord spoke to him very clearly what his mission and purpose was in life. And from that very day, Paul began to run with the vision. He began to move forward with the vision, with his call. He didn't look back. And so now, and he went out and preached the gospel and planted churches and made disciples and raised up leaders. And he already accomplished a lot of things, but now he's sitting here in this house under house arrest. And he's evaluating. He's talking to the church, but at the same time, you can sense this. He's evaluating. He's looking at his past. And as he looks at his past, he's, he talks about being a Hebrews of Hebrews. He tells the church concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. I knew the law. I understood the law. Concerning zeal, man, I'm the one that was persecuting the church. And righteousness of the law, I was blameless according to the law. I was a very religious man. In other words, if anyone had a reason to be confident in his accomplishments, confident in the flesh, or proud of his past, the apostle Paul was. But instead, Paul considered who he was and what he had accomplished as nothing. He said, what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for Christ. That I might know Christ, my personal Savior, and the power of his resurrection. In other words, Paul was willing to give up all of his worldly accomplishments, all his worldly pursuits, so that he might gain Christ. He might know God more, what God's purpose is for his life. And the righteousness that comes from God by faith, not the righteousness that comes from the flesh of the law. Secondly, he evaluated his presence, his present place, where he is now. He looked at where he was now, he evaluated his past, he evaluated where his presence. And Paul said, look, even though I've... I've I've accomplished a lot of things in, in the ministry already. I've established a lot of works for God. I've reached a lot of people. Paul says, I don't yet consider myself to have apprehended or arrived or completed this race. 
In other words, what Paul's conveying to you and I is that no matter what he's even done for Christ all these years, he's still not satisfied. He's still not content. Somehow, someway in Paul, Paul felt there's so much more that God has for me. I might not be as young as I used to be, but I know that God ain't finished with me yet. That there's still some bread in the basket. There's still some stuff in the basement. There's still some things that I can use that God wants to use for his honor and his glory. I don't care what the devil's whispered in my ear. I don't care what people have said. I don't care what my body's telling me. I know that God has more for my life and he ain't finished with me yet. Paul wasn't satisfied with where he was in his relationship with God and what he had done, even though he had already accomplished so much. But Paul, the apostle, was still hungry. He was still hungry for more. He was still desperate for more of Jesus in his life, more of an encounter with God, to know him more in the power of his resurrection and will, is still willing to take more shares of suffering for Christ. Isn't that amazing? In other words, Paul was taking charge of his destiny. He wasn't letting chains dictate, amen, to him what his call was. In fact, Paul says, you can put chains on my hands. You can put chains on my feet, but you can't muzzle my mouth. Oh, hallelujah. Because I've been called to preach. He said, woe unto me if I preach not this gospel. Every soldier that was chained to Paul to, to watch over him, I feel sorry for that man. Can you imagine being chained to the apostle Paul 24 hours a day? Somebody that's constantly evaluating your spiritual life, where you are with God. Do you know Jesus? Paul wasn't satisfied. He still was ready for more. See, sometimes you just got to stop and evaluate where are you today? Where you've been and where you are today so that you can get ready to step into your tomorrow. Number two, evaluate. I mean, excuse me, el eliminate. The second key, eliminate. If you want to take charge of your destiny and move into a, a realm of success in God and how God sees you, then you got to learn how to eliminate. What did Paul say? Forgetting those things which are behind me. Forget about yesterday. Forget about last week. Forget about last month. Forget about 2018. It's almost over. He says, forgetting those things which are behind me. Let me tell you something, church. We cannot walk into our present or into our future holding on to the past. The past is a past. There's nothing we can do about it, whether it was good or whether it was bad. It does not. It's over. It's done. Whatever we did yesterday, the question is, what are we going to do today and what are we going to do tomorrow for Jesus Christ? And some of us, listen, it wasn't a good year. Might have been a hard year. Might have been a very bad year, very painful year. Very, some, some of us lost loved ones maybe this year. People that are very close. Certain things happen. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're diagnosed with some kind of, you know, uh, infirmity or affliction in your body. Or maybe different things happen. Whatever. Some of us didn't have too good of a year. Maybe we just had some setbacks. We, we've had some failures. We've blown it maybe this year. We've made some mistakes. Uh, we made some detours. We, we got out of the will of God. You know, some things happen in life, right? And we made some mistakes. Maybe some of us got hurt. We got hurt with God. We got hurt with people. We got hurt with the church. We got hurt with, with, with brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever. Things happen. Life is life. God never promised that this life was going to be a bed of roses. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, Right? Not everybody's going to always do what they say. Not everybody's always going to be likable. Not everybody's going to always treat you right. Amen? I mean, things are going to happen. God never guaranteed good successes. Amen? Or good circumstances will guarantee true happiness. Right? 
Because happiness doesn't come from good circumstances. It comes from a relationship with God. When he comes and he completes you, my friend. But some of us may have experienced past failures, mistakes, hurts, even past successes and achievements. Might have been our past. It was a good year, but it's still over. I said it's still over. Amen. It doesn't matter. What, it's, it's over. In other words, if we want to take charge of our destiny, there are certain things that you have to eliminate. If you want to move forward, if you want to press forward, if you want to move on with God, there's things that you have to let go. Some things you just have to let go. See, we can't move into the future dwelling on the past. See, our past will keep us in a box. Stuck in a box. If you, if you get just dwell in the past, if you dwell on all the hurts that people hurt you with, with all the mistakes that you made, all the failures and mess ups, the devil will use it. Your own mind will deceive you and put you in a box. Now you're back in a box where God delivered you from a long time ago. When people said this about you and they said, you'll never change, you'll never amount to nothing, you're a zero, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're an idiot. You're a bad seed. And after a while, you start to believe it and you think it. But then one day, one day, Jesus Christ came and interrupted our miserable life and changed us and set us free and got us out of that box and set us on a journey of victory, of victory outreach and victory in Christ. And today we walk with our head held high, knowing who we are in Christ, complete, totally set free by the power of God. With a future and a hope and a destiny. Heaven awaits us. We live for eternity now. People like us now. Mama likes us now. Daddy likes us now. <laughs> Some of you might not understand that, but you, a lot of us. We, people don't walk on the other side of the street anymore when they see us coming. Listen, if we hold on to the past of yesterday, it's going to put you back in a box. It'll put you back in your own prison again where you're stuck, not able to move forward anymore, not able to go on. Every time you come, it's just venom comes out of your mouth because of your past hurts or, or, or just, just always discouraged and, you know, a failure because I messed up. And let me know the devil's a liar. I said the devil is a liar. What you need to understand right now here today, especially you men and women in the home, now that you've been saved, now that you've been born again, now that you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you're never a loser anymore. I said you're, you might have been a five-time loser in the world, but in Christ Jesus, you never lose. Even if you stumble, even if you made a mistake, even if you failed, my friend, you're still a winner in Christ Jesus. More than a conqueror, the Bible says. But many are held back from going forward because they're stuck in the past. Don't let 2018 hold you back from 2019. 2019, you got to look at it as a year of new beginnings. It's a new day. It's a new year, and what you do today, the decisions you make today, the strongholds that you let go today, and the new beginnings and new habits uh, and new focus and perspective that you have today will take you into your future. Take charge of your destiny. Come on, tell you that. Take charge of your destiny. See, many are held back because of their past, something that may have happened or the way we were treated. Let me tell you something. Everybody's got a story. I mean, it would blow, blow your mind if, if somebody really, if when you stopped and asked somebody this morning, hey, how are you doing, brother? If they really stopped and started telling you, you probably wouldn't know how to handle it. Everybody's got a story. I mean, life is life, right? Things happen. And everyone's got a story. But if you want to advance and you want to move forward, some of those stories, you just got to let go now. I say, you just got to let go. 
Stop calling people and texting people and emailing people. Amen. Of all those sad stories. Because it's those sad stories going to keep you in the box. It's going to keep you in 2018. Here we are in 2019 and going into 2020 and you're still stuck in 2018. Talking about the same old story. I mean, it's like when you were back in the world, back in the park, saying the same old stories. If we're going to advance, we got to forget, we got to let go. If we want to move forward, it involves learning to forget. Eliminate. I remember reading this story about the southern general, Robert E. Lee. You heard about him during the Civil War? He was a general, right? And after the Civil War, he went to go visit this Kentucky woman who had showed him the remains of this grand family tree that was planted years ago and were there for generations and generations. And, you know, he came to visit her and she's crying and she's walking with her. I want to show you. And she's crying and giving this whole sad story of how the Union soldiers came and their artillery, you know, their shooting artillery, you know, it, it damaged this, this, this tree that has, was so sentimental to her. It was in the family for years. They remember planting it, her granddaddy and grand, and it, saying all this sad story. And, and, and then she kind of, you know, wiping her tears and, and kind of looks at the general, like, kind of like waiting for sympathy. Yeah. And the general kind of looks at this old lady, respectful, she says, Madam, I have some advice for you. Tear it down and forget it. Just tear it down and let it go. <laughs> Just let it go. Why are you going to be here sitting on this porch year after year, year after year, complaining about some old tree because some enemy came and destroyed it? He said to her, he says, Madam... Just let it go. Cut it down and let it go. And you know, when I read that story, I started thinking, you know, how many people in life are stuck sitting on their porches while others are walking by moving forward towards their destiny, doing what God had called them to do in life, and yet they're, they're stuck on their porches singing, sitting there singing the same old song, crying over spilled milk. Well, I got news for you here this morning. If that's you, my advice is you to just pick up that glass and fill it up again. And let's just move on. What happened, happened. The past is a past. Let it go. See, sometimes in life, if you want to advance and you want to move forward, you've got to eliminate. You've got to cut some things out and just let it go. Isaiah 43, 18 says, forget the former things. Forget the former things. See, I am doing a new thing, saith the Lord. I'm doing a new thing, saith the Lord. Listen, you can't experience the new staying focused and stuck in the old. Eliminate. Let it go. I was listening to the one preacher he was talking about. This is for free. This one preacher he was talking about how, you know, and he's a very, very well-known preacher renowned preacher, right? And uh, he was sitting with these executives, CEOs and executive companies. And he was talking about how privileged he was, how, how God had elevated him. He came from nothing and how God had elevated him. And he's sitting there and they're all talking, right? And, he, and, and he's there, you know, sitting there just listening. And, he, and, and they're talking about, about, you know, success. They're talking about moving forward, about, you know, accomplishing things, great things and taking the company to another level. And he said, one of them said this. He says, he goes, I'm sitting there. He says, he goes, look, gentlemen, before we can step into the future, before we could move forward into our future of success, he says, the question is not is what do we need to get there, but what do we need to let go? What are we willing to let go to get there? <laughs> the preacher said, man, I used to pull out my phone, cell phone. I started using two thumbs right there trying to text the, these statements here. He goes, because it hit him. He goes, sometimes if you want to move forward, you got to evaluate. What are you? What is it you accomplish? What, what, are you, what, 
what, what, just like we do in the church, we vowed every year, what worked, what didn't work, what brought us results, what didn't bring us results. And there are some things that we just have to let go. And stay focused on what's going to bring us to success and what we believe is going to take us further. <laughs> Evaluate and eliminate. And then thirdly, concentrate. Concentrate. Paul said this, forgetting those things which are behind. And then he says this, but this one thing I do. This one thing. In other words, once Paul evaluated and eliminated, then this is a point in his life where he started to zero in on what really was to matter. What really matters in life. Sometimes when you're starting out, you think about a lot of things. And we do a lot of things, right? But after a certain time, a certain point, we have to stop and evaluate and eliminate and then begin to focus on what really matters. What really counts in the kingdom of God in life? What is it? See, people who take charge of their destiny are vision-driven. They're goal-oriented. They are focused on where they're going in their future with God. That is called the power of concentration. The power of focus, the power of concentration, focusing on, like Paul said, this one theme. You know, sometime back, a couple of years, I think it was, a couple of years ago, we were doing a lot of things when I started focusing here in San Bernardino. And we were doing a lot of different things, just kind of business as usual, right? Kind of kept back in here after Chicago, got in here, just and just was observing and watching the leadership, the new leadership, watching the church function, different things, and just kind of staying quiet and, and just watching. And, and I began to realize all the meetings that we're having, the ministers and different things, and just kind of being there, flowing with everything, watching, observing, evaluating. And then I began to look at it, and I said, you know what? You know, we're here, I'm preaching, we're doing this and that, and, and, but I'm still not seeing the results. We're not seeing the results that we should be seeing in VOSB. And so I remember I was at Barnes & Noble. I don't remember re even reason why I was there, but now I know why I was there. And I was walking through the aisles, just looking at these books and different things, and I looked at this one, and it caught my eye, and it caught my attention. It stopped me in my tracks. And, and I felt the Lord tell me, go back and look at that book. And what looked at it, it had it's just says, one thing. That was the title. One thing. I don't know if you ever seen that movie. What was it? I forgot the name of it with Billy Crystal. And they go, they go, they go on, on this business guys and they go out in the western, what is it called? Slickers. City Slickers. Old movie, right? And then I think it was City Slickers 2. I can't remember they had City Slickers 2. And the, what was the guy? The other guy, the one that, that, that was helping them, the guide. And these are business guys, corporate guys, whatever. They want, get, got a way to find themselves. I don't know. But they're guide curly. And they're, they're all, you know, their lives, they're all caught up in their lives and hustle and bustle of life. But then he, he kind of had some pretty heavy, significant insight. Because he told me, you're looking at all these different things, looking for fulfillment in life. He goes, he goes but you got to focus on this. And I said, what is that? He says, one thing. And how true that is. See, sometimes some of us are so caught up and we get infected by what they call phragmatosis. Wow, what is that? <laughs> what phragmatosis is, is when people get so involved in a thousand things but never accomplish anything. Therefore, they have to learn how to stop in life and begin to evaluate, eliminate, and then concentrate. And begin to concentrate on that one thing that really matters. That one thing that really matters, that really is going to count in life. What is it? That's what you got to come to this altar and find out about. The power of concentration. See, successful people concentrate on the one thing. They specialize in that one thing. They become a specialist in what they're good at and what they enjoy doing. My prayer is that in 2019, 
every one of us will begin to evaluate, eliminate, and then begin to concentrate on that one thing that God has gifted you and called you to do. And if you can begin to focus in that one thing, find your place, your niche in the church, where you're gifted, what you, brings you fulfillment and joy when you do it, and you see results. When you find that, that's your one thing, my friend. And begin to concentrate and begin to focus, amen, and begin to specialize in it. And become a specialist in what you do and with the vision that we have that God has for this church is not only you specialize in it, but begin to teach and to train others to equip them in it so that you can send and we can equip and send to the four corners of the world and we can repeat the process and be able to fulfill the great commission of discipling people for the nations of the world. Wow. Oh, that's a lot of say right there. But it's that one thing. Too many of us are caught up doing all kinds of things and not even being effective in that one thing. And we wonder why we come to church frustrated. We come to church burdened. We come to church tired. Because we're not focused on the one thing. And what is that one thing? Making disciples. Reproducing yourself many times over. Rather than doing the work of 10 men, teaching and training 10 men to do the work. Oh, I wish I had more time. Worship team could come. That one thing the church is supposed to be involved in. Great commission. Make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's promised that he'll be with us wherever we go. That one thing. This year is a year of evaluation, elimination, concentration of where we want to be with the Lord this year in 2019. Where we want our ministry to be. Who are we? What are we doing for God? What's my part? Listen, is your part really just coming to church on Sunday for the kingdom of God? That's religious. No, there, there's a place. There's something for you to contribute, something to you to do to help edify and fulfill the great commission. Too many of us are too caught up doing a thousand things, a hundred things. And lastly, I close with this. Evaluate, eliminate, concentrate, and then fourthly, consecrate. In other words, once you find that one thing, what did Paul say? This one thing I do, I press toward the mark. In other words, I'm committed to it now. If this is the one thing that God has called me to do, then I press towards the mark for the prize, the high calling of God, of Christ Jesus for me. Commit to. Once you find it, once you identify it, once you get, commit to it. And my friend, you'll be a believer, a Christian that'll walk with your head held high. You'll be a Christian, a believer that is so fulfilled in life, not a needy Christian, amen, not someone that you have to jumpstart every week. Right? I mean, you're gonna, but you're going to be one that is secure and walking in faith and walking in power and walking in victory. doesn't mean that things are not going to come your way, the trials of life. But, man, you're going to come out of every one of them victorious because you know who you are in Christ. You're doing what God has called you to do. The devil will try and stop you, but he has no more power, no more authority over your life. He cannot stop you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, my friend and God has now made you more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus somebody stand and give God a praise here today 2019 take charge of your destiny if you're called of God it's gonna take not gonna take you 20 years to fulfill that call anymore if you're in the home and you sense a call in your life it's gonna take you 15 years if you're a young man that has an encounter with God and you know that God has called you 
for greater purpose. It's not going to take you 30 years. No, my friend. We are setting this church up to be a launching pad. We are setting this church up to reach the nations. Because that's the one thing that Jesus told the church to do before he left planet earth. Go and preach the gospel to all the world. Go and make disciples of every nation. That is what we are supposed to do, my friend. And where does it start? Right here. It starts right there where you are, right there in your home with your wife, with your children. It starts with your grandchildren. It starts when you come to church and where you serve at. The people that you're serving with, identifying those that are hungry, those that want to grow, those that want more of God, and taking them under your wing and begin to deposit things inside of them that you learned. Just like Paul, look for faithful men, faithful women that you can pour your life into, that they in turn will pour into others also that's the one thing and my friend I'm telling you not only we have to go to double services we'll have to go to three services people are going to be walking around here blessed so fulfilled in God because we're doing the right thing not many things one thing Some of you had a hard year. But today is a day to come and eliminate. Come and bring 2018 to this altar and leave it here. And when you leave this altar, you're stepping into a new beginning. You're going to step into a new day, a new dawn in your life. And the past will be the past. And what you do today will determine where you'll be tomorrow. Every decision you make will set the course for your destiny. Determine your, your destiny, my friend. There's nothing worse in life, like they say, than wasted talent. There's a cemeteries filled with the greatest talent of the, of the world. Books that have never been written businesses that have never been started ideas that have never been generated they're sitting in those cemeteries right now because of the choices that people have made but you and I today have a privilege we're here today we have life we have breath we have a mind we're the greatest species on the face of this earth what are you going to do with it what am I going to do with it what are you going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? What really matters in life? You know what matters in life to me according to the scriptures? The kingdom of God. That's what it all boils down to that matters. is Christ Jesus our Lord and doing his will, serving his purpose for his pleasure in our generation. I'm going to open up these altars here today. If there's some of you that say, you know what? That's it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Come on. I want you to come. You're ready to start new. You're ready to get your, put your hands to the plow. Are you ready this morning? Come on. Get ready. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's a new beginning.